Welcome to First Baptist Church of Gray, Georgia. Led by Pastor Randy Darnell, FBC Gray seeks to help people of all walks of life find Jesus and give Jesus away. If you are ever in the Middle Georgia area, we would love to see you at one of our services. You can learn more about us at fbcgray.org. Now, let's worship the Lord together. We'll sing the first verse and the chorus together, and then we'll ask you to join us on the second verse. Let's sing to the Lord together this morning. Come, people of the risen King, who delight to bring Him praise. Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. From the shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to Him. Where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children in. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, O Church of Christ. His perfect love will never change, and His mercies never cease. But follow us through all our days with a certain hope of peace. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, Shore to shore we hear them call The truth that cries through every age Our God is all in all Rejoice, rejoice Let every tongue rejoice One heart, one voice O Church of Christ Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. That's from Psalm 96. I love that song that we just sang. Because right at the beginning, what does it say? It says, come people of the risen king, come all and tune your hearts to sing his praise. And then it breaks it down. Come those with full or empty hands. Come those whose joy is the morning sun and those weeping through the night. Come those who tell of battles won and those still struggling in the fight. Why? Why does he call both kinds of people? For his perfect love will never change and his mercies will never cease. But they follow us through all our days with a certain hope of peace. Simply said, it doesn't matter what struggle you may be facing in your life or in at home or what struggles your family may be facing. 
God never changes. He knows what you're going through, child of God. And his mercies are new every morning. And when we realize that, when we know that he knows what we are going through, we also realize that he is all we'll ever need. And he's all we ever need to save our souls. We could never work to earn our salvation. But thanks be to God that he gave us his immaculate grace to redeem us and make us his own. We're going to sing an old, old hymn that really speaks of how wonderful God's grace is. Sing it with us. grace. The grace that you bestowed on us that wiped away our sins and made us whiter than snow as we were initially created to be. God, thank you so much for that. You are all we need. You are our one true source of all things. And we thank you for, for letting us enjoy the things that you've provided, the things that you have created. And so, God, to show even more gratitude, we're going to return a portion of what you've let us borrow because we know that our abilities are so limited. But, God, you have unlimited power and unlimited reach. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that as these gifts are received, you take them and you bless them and you multiply them, that your grace may be shared with more people. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Lenora. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Thursday night in our small group, we talked about what it means to be an heir. If you're an heir, that means you have an inheritance, an inheritance of something. But if we're an heir in Christ Jesus, we have an inheritance that only he can give. And that inheritance is a kingdom far away from here, like nothing we've ever seen. Eternal life, eternal hope, all because we have been redeemed by Jesus himself. What a promise that he makes to us. What a sacrifice it took to make it happen. We can't just dwell on the rewards and the benefits without realizing the price that had to be paid. So I invite you to stand with us this morning as we sing about God's sacrifice. Yeah. 
the story ends. See the stone is rolled away. Behold. Well, here we are. Good morning. Uh, listen, one of the things, just, 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 you know, I mean, just neither here nor there or the other place. Um, when my granddaddy used to sing back years and years ago, uh, he embarrassed the dickens out of me. Granddad couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, and uh, and he'd sing, and he'd sing at the top of his lungs. It was like nobody else was in the room. Granddaddy just let her rip. Y'all, be like granddaddy. Don't let anything hold you back. Just let it rip. If it's in your heart, let it out. If it's not in your heart, hunt for it because it needs to be there. Granddaddy didn't care. He just let it go. I would shrink and just want to die. Just die because granddad's just, oh, oh, it didn't even match nothing. It just sounded like howling. Howl, folks, howl. We got something to howl about. Romans 6, y'all look it up right quick. Romans chapter 6. Come on, let's hear some page flutter. There you go, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, we begin with verse 12, and we're going to go through 23. So, it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Are, do we sin? are we to sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." Speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were not free, 
Say it again. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I heard something this week that I couldn't wait to share with you guys. Uh, I was listening to J.D. Greer, listened to his podcast from the Summit Church up in, uh, up in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I listen to him every week, and uh, I listen to Greer. He, he's out of the pulpit a lot. He's president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He travels all over the place. and uh, The other guys, I listen to them every now and then, but I always listen to Greer. I mean, he is... The man is just dynamite. I told, uh, I told the staff that when we get to Romans 8, 28 through 30, which is going to come up in a couple of months, that I'm, I'm just going to play Greer's video. I'm not even going to try. I'm telling you, that's what I heard on the radio this week, that I, I got to tell you all this because it, it, it factors into all of this, and it was just good. It was just good. Helped me to understand a little bit. Romans 8, 29, y'all should know that. I've said it a million times in here. For those, it's, it's the purpose. It's, to me, it's God's purpose for us. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, I know I used the P word in a Baptist church. I use the word predestined, and I know that there's some folks that will freak out over being predestined and all that kind of stuff. When we get to Romans 8, 28, 29, 30, we're going to talk about it. You'll know what I believe. I may or may not know what you believe when it comes down to predestination. won't change the truth, what either of us won't believe, and it won't break our fellowship. If you don't believe like I believe when it comes to that, it doesn't matter. It just don't matter. I've got this strange feeling when we get to heaven anyway, God's going to look at us face to face and he's going to say, y'all argued about some of the stupidest things I have ever heard in my life. Let me explain to you how that really works. And we're all going to sit there and go, oh. Well, here's anyway, to get on with this, those whom he foreknew is where J.D. blew me away. Hadn't thought about this. Y'all, in, 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 in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, Scripture tells us that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Adam knew Eve, and we know what all that means. It's code, you know, for the physical act of intimacy between a man and a woman. And, and, and that's what we think of when we hear that Adam knew Eve. Eve, but if that's all there was to it, if it was just that physical act, then Adam could have just picked any old gal up off the street and it would have been the same thing, but it wasn't. Number one, there was no other gal on the street. But number two is, you know, but number two is, is that he knew her. That's not just the word. That means that there was a relationship that was established between Adam and Eve. It was a loving relationship, a caring co relationship, a compassionate relationship, a loving relationship that developed into a physical relationship that resulted in a child being born. Now see, if it was just the physical act, that, that's where in our society... That's fed the abortion industry 50 million babies because we say, well, a man knew a woman. No, men and women didn't know each other. They just made a baby. In this case, Adam knew Eve. Now, here's where I'm going with this. God foreknew us. Try to follow me. God foreknew us. Now, the way I've always thought about that was is he knew when I was going to be born, where I was going to be born, who I was going to be born to, all the things that I would do in my life, all the good stuff I'd do, the bad stuff I'd do. He knew every hair that's on my head. He knows when I'm going to die. He knows how the surgery's going to turn out. He knows everything that's going to happen. He knows it all. That's the way I've always looked at it. I never understood that he knew me. See, before I was created, before the earth was created, before there was sun, moon, stars, clouds, he already had purposed, God had already purposed that he would love me. That's what it means to biblically know someone. Do you understand what that means? 
Do you want to, does that, I'm telling you, when, when that hit me, I went, wait a minute. Think about what that, y'all, I mean, come on, help me. Give, give me, let me feel some energy coming back that you understand what I'm talking about. You, doofus you, he loved you before anything. Not like, we, you know, yes, Jesus loves, no, he has you on his mind, he made up his mind before you were conceived that he was going to love you. Made up his mind before he started anything. And then when we had our um, recruitment Sunday, we went to the, the Lazarus story. We got to uh, 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 Luke chapter 19, verse 10, and we heard the verse, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Think about how that figures into that. We said the word seek, remember that? The word seek doesn't mean, y'all listen to me, because this I'm not trying to teach y'all to go out and make, make new disciples. What I'm trying to teach you right now is who you are and what it, what it means to you for this stuff to happen. To seek and to save those who are lost, we said seek was not like hide and go seek, where you're trying to go around and find the person that's hidden behind the bush. That when he came seeking, he knew you and was seeking for you when he came with the sole purpose in his mind that he was going to save you from death and destruction, going to save you into eternal life when he came. Now, you want to argue all the intricacies of that with me? You can argue it till the cows come home. Doesn't change the fact. He foreknew you. He loved you. He had in his mind he was going to save you. He was going to stop you from dying and going to hell. He was going to take you and put you into a place where you would have his life for all eternity. Somebody say amen. amen. Heavens to Betsy, folks. Do you understand? Do you understand? Now, how does this all fit in with what we're talking about here? Go back to Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified, we've been made right with God by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have peace with God. I, I meant to emphasize that. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this glory and into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We want to see the glory of God. But not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, okay, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us us because all of this happened before the foundation of time God already in his infinite mercy and his infinite grace looked through all time and space saw me saw you loved me loved you fiercely as children rescued me rescued you every one of us to redeem he paid the price to redeem us from our master's sin so that we would be forever with him says, Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus is your brother. Firstborn. All of this. Now, with all that in mind, Paul asks a question. And this is where people get real confused about grace. They, they start with these, that we can do anything at any time, in any way, and go out and live a libertine or licentious life because of, of what we're about to talk about. And, and Paul asks two questions. In verse 15, he asks, in, all, in verses 1 and 2, it's almost identical question. says, what then, are we to sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means, he says. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can he who died to sin still live in it? The reason he says those two questions is because back in chapter 5, verse 20, he makes this statement. Now, the law came into a the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin is increased, grace abounded all the more. So where sin increased, grace abounded more. So the more sin you had, the more God had to forgive, the more glory of God that it showed. So using that logic, well, then we ought to sin some more, right? I mean, the more we sin, the more the glory of God's displayed. The bigger the sin, the better. We believe this. We believe this as Baptists. We have, we have, not here, but in some churches I've been in, we have some of the, the strangest 
unspoken theology. I was at a church where a divorced man could not be a deacon, ever, under penalty of death. could never be a deacon. If he got divorced 75 years ago and then got remarried and was remarried to a woman for 72 years, he still couldn't be a deacon. No way. Well, die and go to hell. It's all over. He can't be a deacon. But if you murdered your wife, you could be a pastor. You think I'm kidding, don't you? We had a, we had a, uh, we were doing a health, we were going to do a health, uh, a lot of the people in our church were medical people, so we were going to do a health fair. Contacted the Georgia Baptist Convention, asked for somebody to come down and help us learn evangelism. How to do evangelism at an event like this, so they send a guy down to us. Turns out this guy that they sent down to us, very popular guy, traveled all over the place, had served 16 years in prison for murdering his wife. I don't know how he got out, but while he was in, he was saved, became, you know, big preacher, and, and, and somehow got out of prison, and, and he stood in the pulpit that a divorced deacon couldn't get near. He stood in the pulpit who had murdered his wife. Our theology gets a little wonky sometimes, you know? So the worst the sin is, this guy murdered his wife. Well, boy, look at the glory of God there. Yeah, look how much God forgave him of. Paul's saying, is that the way we're going to think? Is this the way this thing's supposed to work? That we should go out and sin more so that grace will be even better? Golly dingoes, guys, let's sin with abandon. I mean, let's, let's, let's let it rip. The more we sin, the more God has to forgive us, the more grace and mercy he gets to display. Glory be to God in his infinite mercy. Let's break out the booze and have some fun. Let's make this church rock and roll. Then you add Romans 8.1 and people really get out of control because Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Sounds like we ought to serve tequila shots for communion and then we can have some dirty dancing and everything will be good, right? Because then God's got to forgive us all the more. Paul says, is this the way this is supposed to operate? Is this what's supposed to happen? He uses a Greek, a Greek word here that we've gone through before. Meganoito is the Greek. We, we translate it sort of nice and say by no means or something like that. When, when, and we've studied this before, y'all know, you may have disagreed with me, but you'd be wrong, and I was right on this one, absolutely. Because when whoever was reading this letter out loud, when they got to that word, they would have went. Now, I didn't say this, Paul did. And then they'd read the word out loud. Because it would make people go, oh. Paul used a deliberately shocking word because he wanted people to understand that no, no this is not what I meant. No, this is not the way this is supposed to operate. Absolutely not do you sin more so grace could abound. Using Randy language here, what I would say is, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? What in the world are you thinking that you could do more sin so that grace would abound? Are you insane? And then Paul makes this argument, and it's a great argument. Look at verse 21. He says in verse 21, but what fruit, this is, a great, this is great to think about, guys. This is such a logical argument that could be asked every time you are tempted to sin. Every time you're faced with some huge temptation that you really want to do it. It looks like it'd be cool. You've done stuff in the past, you know, but hey, this... Mm, this is an opportunity. Verse 21 says, But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? Do you understand what that question says? What did you get out of the things that you did that you're now ashamed of? Because you know the end of those things is death. Before we were saved, while we were still sinners, what good did our sin bring about? What good does your sin bring about? When you do things, when I do things that, that are not what God would want us to do, that are 
you know, in opposition to his character, in opposition to who he is, what good does that ever bring about? What good does that do? And see, I've finally gotten over, it's taken me a long time, but I've finally gotten over the fact of thinking that all of y'all are good people and I'm the only sinner in this room. I finally understood that, you know what, we're all in this thing together. We're all riding that loaf boat, all of us together. Paul's on that boat too. He talks about the same thing. And he says, what good came out of those things that you did that you're ashamed of now? And you know what I know for a fact? That everybody in this room has at least one thing they're ashamed of in their past. You might be the best person that's ever walked on the face of the earth, but I guarantee you there is something that, that you can lean back and you think of today and you think, you know, I wish I'd done that differently. Boy, I sure would like to have that one back. I'd need a mulligan on that one. I, what good did those things bring? Let me give you a little catalog. You know, I look back at my list. Maybe you've only got one on your list. I've got a catalog. It's indexed. It's alphabetized and it has page numbers. I had a car accident one time involving another young lady. We didn't get tickets for the car because we were both in the same condition in that car wreck. And the, and the uh, policeman figured, what good's it going to do? Cost me a lot of time, a lot of money. Didn't help anybody. I can think of a, a couple of people couple of friendships that I've lost because of things I've said and done. I think about some friendships that I've got that have very, very strained or had very, very strained relationships because of the things that I've said and I've done. I've got a few people that I still pray that the Lord never lets me see them again. We've, we've apologized, we've done our thing, we've forgiven each other, but I don't want to see them again. Because every time I see them, it opens up that little hole in my heart that says, you, sir, were an idiot. And you deserve for them to slap you in the face and laugh at you. And I know I'm forgiven in the hope, but I still, that, it's still there. You've got it too. All of us have that in us. And Paul's using that for his argument right here. He's saying, of those things you did, what good came out of them? What good came out of them? You're tempted to do sin again? Remember what you've done in the past? What good came out of that that makes you think this next thing you're going to do is going to have good come out of it? It doesn't work that way, he says. It does not work. It is always shame. It is always death. The outcome of the things that we do that are sinful and disobedience to God never turn out the way we think they're going to. It's always shame. It's always death. So he's saying here in his argument, so should we continue in sin so that we can make God look more powerful and loving because he'd have to forgive us so much more instead of divorcing our wives so we can't be a deacon? Should I just kill her so that his grace will abound and I can become a preacher? And he says, for heaven's sakes, people, what are you thinking? Have you lost your mind? Verse 12, he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not give sin permission to be your boss. That's what that means here. Reign is sort of a hard word for us. We don't have kings in the United States, but everybody has a boss. Everybody has a boss. If you're married, you got a boss. She's the boss and, and you're married. If, if, if you go to work, you got a boss. Everybody's got a boss. Everybody's got somebody that tells them. We know what that means. He says, do not give sin the permission to be your boss. Don't do that. And don't pass over this phrase mortal body because he uses that phrase on purpose. Mortal means it'll die. What he's trying to say here is do not let sin be the boss of you while you're living in this temporary condition. This is temporary. It may seem like a long time for us, but if somebody lives to be 105 years old, we're all going, whoa, look how long they lived. 105 in the scheme of history is nothing. It's temporary. And he says, don't let sin be the boss of you while you're in this temporary condition. Don't give sin permission to be your boss, to make you obey your desire for that which is forbidden. Do y'all remember the, remember the movie Grease? Y'all remember Greece? Came out in 1978, but it's been played a lot on television. And every high school that's ever been has done a, a, a play, you know, Greece the musical. Everybody in the world's done that. Do y'all remember the story? You've got Sandy, Olivia Newton John. I ought to ask for a 
all the men to raise your hand. How many of you had don't do it? How many of you, I told you in trouble, how many men had a crush on Olivia Newton-John? I'm telling you right now, if she'd walked into the room, I'd have passed out cold. Lord, have mercy on my soul. Thank you, Lord. But, so Olivia Newton-John is in this movie, and John Travolta, I know, he was, you know, he's, he's Danny the Stud Muffin. Olivia Newton-John comes in, she's this prim and proper girl from Australia, only supposed to be there for the summer, but she ends up staying for the the school year and she went to Rydell High School. Y'all remember it was Rydell High School. Here she is all prim and proper. And who does she fall for? Forbidden fruit. She falls for Danny the Stud Muffin. The guy that he's supposed to want. All the fast girls. Y'all know what I mean when I talk about fast girls, right? He's on that side of the track. So he's supposed to be wanting all the fast girls, but now he wants forbidden fruit too. He wants the girl on the good side of the track that's how we operate that's how we work the ending of that movie is a little bit interesting Sandy does help reform Danny somewhat but Danny does help corrupt Sandy somewhat see it's not really the happy ending that we think it is we walk around singing you're the one that I want you know we sing the song it's all bouncy and good but it's forbidden fruit And that's what we want. We always want those things that we shouldn't have. And that's what he's saying right here. Don't give sin permission to be the boss of you so that it tells you that those things that you should not want are the very things that you do want. And the crazy thing here is he's telling you that you have the power to do that. Now, he understands we've got the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, We've got all of this working with us, but he's saying that you've got a part in this, that you choose this. Don't give sin permission. Verse 13 says, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for righteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. When Paul says members, he means our hands, our feet, every part of our body. He says don't present them as to... uh, Don't present them to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. The word instruments could be translated weapon as well. I like that better. In the world in which we live right this minute, we need some weapons of righteousness. In the world we're in right now, unless you've been on a trip to Mars, you know that we are living in a culture shift like we've never been in before. We understand that. We want to blame it on the baby boomers and on the 60s and 70s. I blame it on our parents. Because our parents raised us, so they gave us more than anybody's ever had before, and we thought we were entitled, and so we had the 60s and 70s and sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And the next thing you know, you got crazy people doing all the crazy things that are going on and being said right now. We are in a huge culture war. Present your body, he says, as a weapon of righteousness, not a weapon of sin. If you present your body to sin, you're a weapon weapon for the wrong thing. If you allow yourself to be involved in sin, you're on the wrong side of the track. You're doing the wrong thing. You're not supposed to be there. Have you seen Iron Man? The movie Iron Man? Y'all saw Iron Man? I've not seen the last Avenger movie yet, so don't spoil it for me. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm thinking not on pay-per-view, and I might watch it on pay-per-view, so, you know. But the Iron Man, the original Iron Man, y'all remember Tony Stark, narcissistic industrialist. He gets kidnapped. He's in the cave in Afghanistan. He does all this stuff to get out. But when he gets out, he notices that all over the place, his business builds weapons that are supposed to be used to protect the United States and to protect all the good guys. And here his weapons are being used by the bad guys. His weapons that were supposed to be used for righteousness were instead in the wrong hands and being used for unrighteousness. And Tony, of course, that that sets the whole movie up there. That's what happens when our that's what happens when our weapons get in the wrong hands. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin and give our members to the wrong side. We are not slaves to sin anymore because Jesus paid the ransom. 
He paid the price for sin with his death and burial, and he paved the way to new life for us by his resurrection. And because we've been freed, we can dedicate ourselves to the path that we choose, and we're going to choose a path. We're going to choose a path. There's only two ways to go. You can't sit the fence. You can't ride this one out. You've got to choose one or another. You can either choose to walk up to the Father and offer the members of your body as weapons of righteousness that brings life and hope to people, or you can do the opposite. But those are your only two choices. Now, I won't lie to you. It is very spooky to make a choice that you don't know where it's going to go. It is. I've watched a lot of people live in a lot of strange situations because that's the situation they're comfortable with. Watch people that remain drug addicts, that remain in abusive situations, that remain in sickness, all kinds of horrible conditions, because that's what they know. That's how they've always lived. They're afraid to try to get out of that, because if they get out of that, life might be different, and if life is different, then what will I do? I won't know what to do. I won't know where to go, so it's just better to stay just like I am right this minute than it is to try to change anything. Y'all know people like that. It may be you that I am comfortable in the diseased situation that I live in because I'm afraid of what I might get. But Paul tries to peek inside the door to let you see what's on the other side. He says that if we present our members to God, that they become weapons of what is right and what is good and a weapon of justice. That we become the good people that we want to be. He tells us that we're under grace, that perfection is not required. He says that if we're obedient, that we'll live more and more right as time goes on. And then there'll be more and more people like Jesus. He says that everything we will touch while we're being obedient leads to good. And when we're disobedient, it leads to death. Because he says the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you guys, a lot, a lot of you are a little older folks. There's a few of the younger guys here. Y'all remember the movie or do you know the movie or the franchise, the Final Destination franchise? Any of y'all know Final Destination? Y'all know Final Destination? Y'all know, yeah, Final Destination movies. Here's the premise of the Final Destination movies. There was a guy uh, and had his friends and they were going to a race, I believe it was. And he had a vision that at the race, a car was going to go out of control and go into the crowd and he and all of his friends would be killed. And he convinced his friends, the vision was so real to him, he convinced his friends not to go. And the wreck did happen and if they had been there, they would have been killed. And so they cheated death. So the premise of this movie is, is that death is coming after him because he's going to get his victims. So he goes after each one of them to kill each one of them. So that's, that's what Final Destination is. But the reason I thought about that was this. Do you know how the word wage can be translated? Final Destination. I thought that was cool. I thought that was real cool because here's the deal. The final destination of sin is death. It's going to get you. You can cheat it. You can hide from it. You can do everything in the end. But the final destination of sin is death every stinking time. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, you can't work on it, you can't work to earn it, you can't clean yourself up to receive it. In fact, I'd tell you, don't try to clean yourself up because when you try to clean yourself up, you're going to try to be what everybody else says that you're supposed to be and they're half whack too. Let God clean you up. Let God clean you up. Come to him, trust in Jesus, let him clean you up. You don't have to... You do have to realize that the final destination of life is death, and you cannot stop it. You know the things that you're doing, and you know that the things you're doing is guaranteeing that you will die. You don't want it anymore, and that's when you hear Jesus. He's looking for you. He knew where to find you. You can't live off the grid for Jesus. You can't hide from him because he foreknew you. He purposed in his heart forever that he was going to love you and find you and bring you to salvation. 
He died on a cross. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. He lay there on Friday. He lay there all day on Saturday. On Sunday, he was laying there when the father called and woke him up and said, come back to life. And when he came out of the grave, we all came out of the grave with him. He did it for justice. Doing the wrong thing requires consequences. He couldn't just let us off the hook. Somebody had to bear the penalty for all that craziness that we've all done, and that was Jesus. Your part is to receive the gift. You stake your life on Jesus. You go all in with Jesus. You say to him, I will follow you from now on to the best of my abilities, to the end of my life, and then you get out of the way. And he takes you the rest of the way. So there you are. Here's the killer. I'm afraid you're going to go home and have just heard a sermon. And I sure don't want that to happen. I don't want it to happen. And I'm not talking about if you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christian, I'd encourage you to trust Christ as your Savior. I'd, I'd encourage you to think real hard about it before you do because the world don't want you to do that right now. There's a lot of crazy people in this world that think there's 56 genders. Uh, it's just they've, they've all lost their minds. They've just lost their minds, and they're trying to destroy Christianity because Christianity is truth, and, and they want their own truth, and, and, it's, and it's crazy. So it'd be hard for you to be a Christian in the environment that we're in right now, but I tell you that if you make that decision, you will never regret that. You will go through hardship and, and trouble, and these preachers that preach that you'll get a jet plane and a new car are liars, and I'm afraid that they're bound to hell. I don't know, can't condemn them to hell, but they sure are preaching a message that is not the gospel. The gospel is, is that you're going to suffer, that life's going to be hard, but that God's going to be with you every step of the way, that our flesh is temporary, and one day we're going to be sitting with him physically in heaven, even though if you go to Ephesians 2, it says that we're already with him in spirit already, sitting at the right hand of the Father. But those of you who are Christians, I'm telling you, I was driving home the other night, and I didn't know what to do with myself. Because I understood what it meant to be loved by God. Every battle I face, I mean, this is the big thing. I, I think, you know, you run a business, and, 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 and you run businesses, and y'all run businesses, and others of your employees and businesses, and we have all these battles that we have to fight, and all these things that we have to do, and, and, and people that want this, and people want that, and they want the other. And to realize, to realize that, you know what, every battle that I face has been won already because he goes before me. And it's going to turn out like he wants it to go. And I'm supposed to do my part and follow him. I'm not saying that I lean back and go, well, God's going to handle it. Let go and let God. I ain't saying that at all. What I'm saying is, is that I'm supposed to do my part, follow him, best of my ability. Don't give sin permission to take me to things that are forbidden, but turn myself over to him in righteousness. And then accept the fact that he's walking with me all the time everywhere I go. Some of y'all got bad bosses. Y'all go to work and you're miserable at work because you work for people that are just stupid. I had one of those. And I thought I was trapped. I thought, I thought that I couldn't get out of it. I had a wife, three kids, two dogs, a bird, and a turtle. Every one of them wanted to be fed. Every one of them wanted a roof over their head. Every one of them wanted to be warm in the wintertime and cool in the summertime. And I worked for a woman that had me, me so confused that I thought I was trapped and there was no way I could ever get out of that. And that was a lie from the pit of hell. While I walked through that, Jesus was with me all the way. And after, I think it was 17 months, he delivered me out of that. She went back to where she came from, placed Jesus. And I got another boss and realized once that was in, that God was with me all the time, that it was all under control, that I worried and fretted and fought and fumed when I could have leaned back just a little bit and go, you know what, this stinks, but this too is going to be over. Be the man that God's called you to be. You're not trapped. And I'm going to keep going on and on and on because I want to see the light come on your eyes so bad. I want you to understand when you walk out of here that there is nothing facing you that you cannot handle because Christ is in you. You are free 
you don't have to sin and you don't have to live with sin and you don't have to worry about what anybody says about you Lord of mercy I'm a preacher people say all kinds of things about me so what one of these days I'll be out of this earth suit and moved on to somewhere else and people can talk about somebody else but it won't matter because I will be on my knees before almighty God in heaven and he will reach down and take me by the hand and I'm going to get to see things that some of y'all are still going to be dreaming about and it's going to be good and one day you'll get there and we'll eat all the ice cream and fried chicken we want because we won't be able to get fat hallelujah glory be to God y'all please don't walk out of here this morning and check the mark that said I've been to church when you leave today you remember who you are you are a child of the king the master of the universe and that makes you a master of the universe too don't it because you are his child different way but it sort of works I'll shut up Father, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you so much for loving us. Lord, I was talking to one of our members after the first service. And he said that Ravi Zacharias said once, saying this to the congregation and to you, Lord, that we all have just about as much Jesus as we want. And that sort of slapped me in the face because I think that's true. That we all have just about the amount of Jesus that we want. Father, open up our eyes that we can see that the infinite gift that you have given to us. That our vision of you is so pathetically small that we have believed the lie that Satan has said so many times that we will be weird and odd and our life will be a living hell because people will laugh and ridicule us without us ever understanding Father that if they do what would it matter we're a child of the king that you loved us you purposed in your heart to love me before you created a thing that you knew what was going to happen on this earth and you did it knowing that you'd have to come looking for me and that while I was still a sinner Jesus would have to die for me while I was of no value to you whatsoever you would come looking for me and pave the way for me to be free. Father, teach us as a congregation how to be free in Jesus. Help us how to know how to strip off all of the, of the chains that bind us so that we can be free. Please, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.